I was speaking about the structure of imagery in the Bible and was saying that the imagery tends to split into two opposed categories. One I'm calling the apocalyptic or the ideal. It's the one that's associated with the Garden of Eden, with the Promised Land, with Jerusalem and the Temple, with Jesus' spiritual kingdom. And the other I'm calling the demonic. It's what is associated with the heathen kingdoms of tyranny, Egypt and Babylon and in the New Testament, Rome. Now, <clears throat> that means that the whole of biblical imagery tends to fall into these two sharply opposed categories that there is no image in the Bible which does not have both an apocalyptic and a, and a demonic context, or, or at any rate, which may not have both. There is no image in the Bible which is necessarily always demonic or always ideal. Uh, that is, there is no natural image. A serpent, for example, is usually a sinister image in the Bible because of its role in the Garden of Eden story, but it's a quite genuine symbol of wisdom in most of the religions and mythologies of the world, and it's used that way by Jesus as well, be ye wise as serpents. And uh, <clears throat> so that it depends on the context whether an image belongs to one category or the other, but the context is never very difficult to determine. <clears throat> Now, I was dealing with the various categories of imagery, and we started with the paradisal. And I said that the great image for that was the oasis, which has in particular two images, the tree of life and the water of life. And we traced those through the Bible. If you look at the book of Psalms, for example, the very first psalm applies the same image to the private and individual life. The righteous man, we are told, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And uh, the same images recur through the New Testament as well. And as we tried to show, they the, they contain the entire action of the Bible being the first things that man loses at the opening of the narrative and the last thing that he regains at the end of it. Now, <clears throat> it follows, therefore, that these paradisal images would also have to have their demonic counterparts. The complication here is that there are two kinds of demonic imagery in the Bible. In the first place, there is the odd paradox of the fact that the only kingdoms which are consistently successful and prosperous are the evil kingdoms. It is Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Tyre which have the kind of power and prosperity that Israel itself desperately longed to have and would have regarded as a mark of divine favor if it had had it. And so that the prosperity of the heathen kingdoms forms a category of imagery that you can call the parody demonic, which has all the qualities of the real thing except permanence. And then there is also, of course, the manifest, or the you just wait demonic, which is what all this prosperity and success will eventually and inevitably turn into sooner or later. Now, we saw that the tree and water of life of the Garden of Eden 
the water of life was associated with four rivers. Two of those rivers are the Euphrates and the Tigris of Mesopotamia. The third is usually identified with the Nile in Egypt. And the fourth, possibly, as Josephus suggests, with India. So, clearly, the parody demonic would be these rivers as they as they came to be in history that is the Nile the Euphrates and the Tigris we start with those in any case they are the rivers that gave prosperity and success and fertility to Egypt, to Babylonia, and to Assyria. Nineveh is on the Tigris, and Babylon is on the Euphrates. And to that again, you could add the commerce and shipping in the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf, which increased the success and prosperity of the Mesopotamian kingdoms, and also of Phoenicia. Uh, Phoenicia <coughs> occupied the northwest part of Israelite territory and in contrast to the Israelites which never consistently held a port on the Mediterranean they were great seafarers and traders and so these rivers of history are the water of life for these heathen kingdoms. They sustain their, their prosperity and their uh, commercial prestige. And again, their, their fertility, which is uh, uh, an important recurring image of a slightly different category. Now, there's been a great deal of work done on the Bible and its relationship to comparative folklore and mythology generally, and the general assumption underlying that is that there's nothing in the Bible that can't be found in some form or other, that some analogy cannot be found to in some uh, mythology or folklore elsewhere. But you could reverse the axiom and say that there is really nothing essential in the folklore or mythology of any civilization whatever that cannot be found in some form or other in the Bible. And uh, if you do reverse the axiom in that way, you find a great many images in the Bible which are parody images of very widespread myths. And one of these is the world tree. The world tree is something, sometimes, the same thing as the tree of life, and it belongs to mythologies far older than the Bible. And as it develops in mythology, it comes to be a form of what is called the axis mundi, that is the vertical aspect of existence. That is, its roots form the lower world below this one, and its fruits and, and branches are in an upper world above this one. And the surface of this world has usually been in mythology a middle earth. It has usually been a world with an upper world in the sky and a lower world underground. And this axis mundi, or world tree, extends all through these three worlds. And in more sophisticated developments, the planets are the fruits hanging from its branches. 
you find it in Norse mythology in Yggdrasil, and you find it in nursery tales like Jack and the Beanstalk, and uh, you find it uh, practically everywhere you look. And so we're not surprised to find that when the prophets start denouncing the apparent prosperity of Egypt or Assyria or Babylon, they will use an image of this kind in a parody context. If you look, for example, at Ezekiel in the 31st chapter, this is an oracle against Egypt which applies to Egypt the same image that is applied to Assyria. And the story of Assyria was a particularly dramatic one for the Old Testament writers. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, was the greatest city of the ancient world, and according to the book of Jonah, it was a three days journey to cross it from its western suburbs to its eastern one. And yet, quite suddenly, Nineveh just vanished and disappeared under the sands where it remained until the middle of the 19th century. But almost immediately after it was destroyed, it was impossible for anybody else even to find the site of the world's greatest city. So the, <clears throat> the suddenness with which heathen power could vanish almost overnight was a favorite theme of prophecy naturally enough, and Ezekiel in this chapter says in verse 3, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick, <coughs> thick boughs. <coughs> and his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters. Now here is a parody description of a world tree identified with the Assyrian power, which uh, is nourished by the water of life and <coughs> fertilizing its roots. And <coughs> In verse 8, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him, the fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. But, of course, <coughs> the Assyrian kingdom falls with a great crash. And and in verse 16, there's a significant comment. <clears throat> I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. <clears throat> So that the, the great Assyrian tree has fallen to the level of the vanished Garden of Eden <clears throat> before the beginning of history. And there is probably a fairly specific allusion there to the tree of life or the world tree in Assyrian mythology, because you find it on Assyrian monuments. And uh, in the much later book of Daniel, there is a very similar tree associated with Nebuchadnezzar in the power of Babylon. And the language used about this tree is even more explicitly a description of a world tree in Axis Mundi. This is in Daniel in chapter 4, <clears throat> and verse 20. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, 
whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, remember that meat means food of any kind, under which the beasts of the field dwelt. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. So that the, <clears throat> the world tree is here explicitly said to reach to heaven and to be visible from all over the world. <clears throat> well, that is the image, then, of temporary prosperity, and it's contrasted with the manifest demonic, which is the more direct parody of the ideal image, and what you would get here as the main units of the manifest demonic are the tree of death and the water of death. <clears throat> now, as I said earlier, the most obvious and dramatic image of the water of death is the Dead Sea, because it is quite literally dead water in which nothing can live. There's too much salt in it. And traditionally, though not explicit, the evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire from heaven and sunk under the Dead Sea. And <clears throat> similarly, the Red Sea is also an image of the water of death, largely for political reasons, because at the time of the Exodus, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, but the Egyptian army was drowned in it, so that symbolically and metaphorically, the Egypt is sunk under the Red Sea, as Sodom and Gomorrah are under the Dead Sea. And Ezekiel directs an oracle against Tyre, the great commercial city of Phoenicia, and says that eventually Tyre will turn into a rock. The words Tyre and rock are very close together in Hebrew. They make a pun. And the rock will be again sunk under the sea. So the image of the kingdom sunk under water, which is what happened, of course, to the whole of the earth in the time of Noah's flood is an image of the demonic water of death. <clears throat> All right. Now, again, remember that metaphorical thinking is not logical thinking. And what you're dealing with when you're thinking in metaphors is not a world of solid blocks or obstacles. It's not a, wor a world of nouns that can be kicked around by verbs. It's uh, a world of metaphors or metaphorical imagery. is a world of forces and energies which often uh, modulate into one another. And so that the tree of life in the Garden of Eden before the fall may be thought of as a tree in a garden, or it may be thought of as all the trees in the garden, or it may be thought of as the body of the unfallen Adam himself. And that imagery of the divine man, or the man with the divine destiny, being metaphorically identical with the tree of life, <clears throat> runs 
all through the Bible, and it accounts for a very central metaphorical expression. That is the Hebrew word Messiah, of which the Greek equivalent is Christ. And what that word means is the anointed one, the person who has been confirmed as a royal figure by an anointing ceremony which symbolically and metaphorically identifies him with the tree of life. That is assuming that something like olive oil or a vegetable oil or a tree oil of some kind would be used in the anointing ceremony because I doubt that anywhere in the Jewish or Christian tradition, at any rate, I don't know about the Muslim one, they would not use petroleum for such a ceremony. <laughs> but <clears throat> the, uh, the identification of the Messiah with the tree of life remains fairly constant throughout the New Testament. I say New Testament because in the Old Testament, the word Messiah simply means a legitimate ruler whose right to rule has been confirmed by some anointing ceremony, whether real or assumed, and King Saul, who was rejected, is still called the Lord's anointed, the Messiah, and uh, so once is a person outside the Israelite community altogether, King Cyrus of Persia, who was called the Lord's anointed by Isaiah. But by the time of Jesus, with the Maccabean victory still fresh in the Jewish mind, there was a good deal of speculation about a figure called the Messiah. And that figure is a figure of the type that theologians call eschatological, that is, a, a, a figure concerned with the ending of history and the <clears throat> evolution of man out of time into some other kind of, of existence entirely. And so, became, uh, so there came the question about who is the Messiah, and that, of course, is still the question that divides Judaism and Christianity. But what <clears throat> I'm concerned with at the moment is not that, but the, the metaphorical identification with a tree of life. Now, in the story of the Exodus, the water of death has, has two aspects. It is, in the first place, the water that drowns the Egyptians, and in the second place, the water from which the Israelites escape in, and become a nation by doing so. Similarly, the flood of Noah is an event in which everybody gets drowned except the family of Noah, but <clears throat> in which the family of Noah escapes by floating on top of the flood with the ark. And that is carried over into the Christian symbolism of baptism, where again the same ambiguous imagery occurs, symbolically and metaphorically, the person who is baptized dies to one world and is reborn in another. And <clears throat> if you apply similar images to the tree of death, the tree of death, of course, would be represented by such a thing as the barren fig tree that was cursed by Jesus at the time of the Passion. <clears throat> The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is clearly a sinister tree as far as the results of eating it are concerned. And 
this tree of knowledge quite clearly has something to do with the discovery of sex as we know it. That is, as soon as they eat of the tree of knowledge, Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. And this inspired a feeling of shame, which uh, meant that the present uh, rather frustrating sexuality that we know as that came into the world when man fell into a lower state of being. And so, if Adam before his fall was metaphorically a tree of life, then after his fall he would be metaphorically a tree of death or of, of uh, moral and sexual knowledge. And <clears throat> we find as one of the laws written in the book of Deuteronomy, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy 21 and 23, verse 23 that is, the law is, if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God. And again, the symbol of the tree of death, which is under the curse of God, like the barren fig tree cursed by Jesus, is here associated with <coughs> a hanged criminal. Now, what is true of the Red Sea, that is both a symbol of death and a symbol of renewed life, depending on whether you're looking at it from the Egyptian or the Israelite point of view, uh, is true also of the cross, which is a tree of death so far as it expresses uh, the human reaction to God, and uh, a tree of, of life for <coughs> members of Christianity. And so you're not surprised to find, perhaps, that Paul quotes this law of Deuteronomy and applies it to the crucifixion. That is, uh, in, on Galatians, 3 and 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And <clears throat> that again expresses the ambiguity of the tree of death symbol is exactly parallel to the water of death one. It's a, it's a death symbol from some points of view and a salvation image from other points of view. And this is all part of a symbolism which is consistent in the New Testament of the Messiah or Christ figure as simultaneously a figure of triumph and transcendence and also a victim figure, a scapegoat figure. As we'll see later, there are many Old Testament prototypes, or as Christianity interpreted them, of Jesus in the Gospels. One of them is King Solomon, the king who built the temple and was the teacher, traditionally the teacher of wisdom. And uh, Solomon, however, was only one of 
David's many sons. David had another son called Absalom, and Absalom rebelled against his father. And in 2 Samuel 18, his manner of death is described. Verse 9, And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And so David's general, Joab, comes up to him and thrusts darts into his side and kills him while he's hanging on the tree. Well, Absalom's curious helplessness in what seems a relatively easy situation to get out of indicates a certain ritual element in his death, perhaps. And uh, <clears throat> traditionally, he was hung from the tree by his beautiful golden hair and it reminds one of certain cults connected with the oak tree and the mistletoe where a human sacrifice would be initiated by cutting the mistletoe as the golden solar emblem from the branches of an oak. But however that may be, the symbolism of Absalom hanging on a tree and having darts thrust into his side is something that's as, as essential to the story of Jesus as the as the uh, aspect of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which is also a part of the imagery. <clears throat> Any question that far then? Well, that phrase, knowledge of good and evil, is not, for, not very clearly explained in the Bible. It does seem to be a genuine kind of knowledge, but it seems to be also an, not really an exchange of ignorance for knowledge, but rather an exchange of one kind of knowledge for another, and the suggestion being that the knowledge of good and evil is forbidden because it is in the long run pure illusion. It's the knowledge of judging things morally, if one wants to translate the phrase literally. And there are various psychologists today who talk about the myth of the lost phallus, that is, that in mythology there is a, a strong impulse on the part of mankind to believe in an original, a complete sexuality, which is very different from the <clears throat> kind of thing that we now know as sexual experience, and the eating of the tree of knowledge clearly had something to do with the the uh, acquiring of a sexual knowledge, which is very largely frustration. And uh, so that the, the phrase, while it remains obscure, also suggests a perspective on human life, which man is eventually to transcend when he gets the tree and water of life back again. And if I can <clears throat> perhaps just anticipate by a, a, a suggestion here, I think of the perspective it's associated with is the legal perspective of man as between an accuser and a defender and a subject to the legal metaphors of trial and judgment. That's an image which runs all through the Bible, but 
it clearly relates only to one level of human existence and the human condition. Right? Well, then we find that, that Israel goes through the three stages that I mentioned earlier, the pastoral stage, the agricultural stage, and the urban stage. And these are all images of a nature which is transformed by human effort and energy into something with a human shape and a human meaning. What man really wants is what his work shows that he wants whenever he gets a chance to work and doesn't have to waste his life making war or feeding a parasitic class. When he gets a chance to work, he is transforming the animal world into a world of flocks and herds, the vegetable world into a world of crops of harvest and of vintage, and the world of stones and minerals into a world of cities and buildings and highways. Let us take, for example, the pastoral world. And that is a world of flocks and herds. Now, the Bible invariably uses the sheep as the typical apocalyptic or ideal animal. I have suggested in one of my books that the reason for that is that sheep societies are perhaps more like human societies than those of any other animal because the sheep is gregarious, stupid, and easily stampeded. <laughs> uh, and it is consequently the appropriate animal to describe in pastoral metaphors, words like pastor and flock still survive in language about the church. But as far as pure metaphor is concerned, there is no earthly reason why bulls and cows should not be as uh, appropriate images as sheep. And <clears throat> here we have to consider the importance and influence in the Bible of what you might call negative ritual. That is, the fact that the Israelites are so frequently forbidden to do things, quite obviously because their neighbors did them. For example, we are told many times in the Mosaic Code, thou shalt not see that is boil, thou shalt not boil a kid in his mother's milk. And that is the basis for the <clears throat> Jewish kosher rule about not mixing milk and meat dishes. But uh, boiling a kid in its mother's milk is not something that would occur to anybody off the top of his head. <laughs> and so it looks as though that must have been a fertility rite on the part of the neighboring Canaanites, which the Israelites were required to separate themselves from. And similarly, the bull was a favorite fertility image in neighboring countries, and for that reason is regarded with some suspicion as an appropriate emblem for the faithful and obedient Christian. In the Old Testament, for example, there is a story in the Exodus 
that while Moses was absent conversing with God at Mount Sinai, his brother Aaron, the high priest, led the tribes of Israel into idolatry by making a golden calf as an idol. Uh, <clears throat> calf there means bull. And that is a type of the later split in the kingdom between the ten tribes of northern Israel and the tribe of Judah when the king of northern Israel, Jeroboam, set up local shrines with the emblem of a golden calf, again meaning a bull, as uh, indicating a departure from the, from the line of religious orthodoxy. And in New Testament times, the great rival of Christianity through the Roman Empire was the religion of Mithraism, where the chief event of the year was the celebration of the birthday of the sun on December the 25th. And Mithraism went everywhere the Roman Empire went. A Nazi bomb falling in London uh, exposed a Mithraic temple during the war. And if you go to Rome, one place that you should definitely not miss is the Church of San Clemente, where there's a series of four or five churches of different periods, and a Mithraic temple lies at the very bottom of the whole structure. The great emblem of Mithraism was the bull, and, uh, and its great right, right was the sacrifice of the bull, which was a repetition of an original creation myth. And forms, again, an exact parallel to the Christian sacrifice of the Lamb, who is, according to the book of Revelation, slain from the foundation of the world. So it's this affinity of the bull with heathen kingdoms that knocks it out as a normal image of the pastoral world. And, in fact, one could almost put it under the parody demonic images. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. It's, um, it's an objection, I think, uh, not uh, to, uh, to its being a fertility symbol, that is to its being used in fertility rituals, which are not those of, of Israel. It's, it's the use made of it in, in other religions and other rituals that uh, is the reason for the suspicion of which is regarded. The lamb is, in the first place, the, the appropriate sacrificial animal in the New Testament. Jesus has the role both of the tree of life in his eternal aspect and of the tree of death as a crucified martyr. And in the same way, in this symbolism, he is both the shepherd, that is, the person in charge of the sheepfold, and the sacrificial victim, the lamb. And that symbolism, of course, is very deeply rooted in the Old Testament, where it repeats the story of the Passover, which we'll come to next day, and the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, and so forth. There are, there would be certainly uses of sheep in other religions. One thinks, for example, of the golden fleece in the story of the Argonautic voyages, whatever that was. But uh, uh, in any case, the, uh, 
it's more the accidents of history that cause certain images to be favored rather than others. Well, we'll continue elaborating this pattern next day, then.